This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the largest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip.io. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test passed? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied into a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeShip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically for fuss-free continuous delivery. Check them out at CodeShip.io. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A., bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them, but if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues Podcast. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 176 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Avi Grimm. Hello from Pennsylvania. Saran Yitbark. Hey, everybody. Pete Hodgson. Hello from the city that knows how. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Before we get started, I really want to plug a new podcast that I've been listening to. It's called the Code Newbie Podcast. Woohoo! Uh, Saran does it. I just, I've listened to the first few episodes and it is, it is a new favorite. So. Aw, thanks. I did not pay him to say that, just for the record. You didn't pay <laughs> me enough to say that. <laughs> but anyway, I, I really want to, uh, you know, give a shout out since she's on the show and I think it's a terrific resource. So, even if you're not a code newbie per se, we're all newbies in some way, and I've learned a ton from them. So, so that's my plug. Yeah, let's let's get going with the show. Pete, do you want to give us a brief introduction of who you are? My name is Pete Hodgson, and I'm a consultant at a software consulting company called ThoughtWorks, the one that Martin Fowler works at. And yeah, that's me. I guess I've been, I've kind of spent the last few years working in a bunch of different tech stacks. Quite a lot of Ruby, quite a lot of Rails, but also iPhone and JavaScript and Scala and lots of different toys that I've been playing with in the last few years. Very cool. And Martin Fowler actually knows who he is because he recommended Pete to me for the iFreak show. So we yeah, talk right. every week. Uh, right, Martin I'm Fowler just... knows who he is. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused. So you don't just work at ThoughtWorks. You were personally recommended for the iFreak show. Yeah, well, that's nice to you. Smart person. You gave a talk at RailsConf. That's right. Yeah. What was the title of my talk? I actually don't remember. Rails is an SOA client. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah how does, so how does that work? So I guess that the, the talk was a little bit sneaky. It was a little bit about Rails as an SOA client, uh, but it was also about quite a lot about just working in like a service-oriented environment in general and how to build systems that get along together by partly by building teams that get along together. So there's a little bit of stuff around Conway's law and then quite a lot of stuff about the techie details of, of Rails and how it works as a client in an ecosystem. Um, so may, maybe maybe uh, good to start with a kind of a definition of what I mean by Rails as an SOA client. Basically, it's this idea that rather than uh, historically we had these monolithic Rails. Initially, we when we you know everyone built their first Rails application, it was a Rails app that talked to a database and that was about it. And then maybe along the way, we start integrating with third party services. So Facebook or Twitter or something like that, some kind of external API. But then also a lot of the times, particularly nowadays, we're integrating with internal systems, like internal services within an organization. And we're also starting to take our big monolithic Rails applications, our mono Rails, 
and break them up into small kind of collaborating services. So what I'm interested in, or what I was interested in this talk, was talking about how you can build a Rails app that's kind of a front-end to these services. So it's kind of a client in the client server sense to back-end services, which may or may not even be implemented in, in Rails or in, in Ruby for that matter. So in the talk, you mentioned Conway's Law, which says that how people work together affects system architecture and vice versa. How does that relate to SOA? So that's a good question. My, by the way, my, I always have a really hard time describing Conway's Law, and I figured out the best way to describe it the other day. Uh, software systems, oh, what is it? Dogs look like their owners. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's, great. that's a great way of describing it. <laughs> yeah. So the way that it fits into SOA is, so the, this Conway's Law thing is that the shape of your teams inevitably influences the shape of your architecture. But it's not, and, and it is kind of a law in that it, it will happen. You don't, you don't get to kind of like push against it and fix it. It's kind of like gravity. It's going to happen to you. But you can kind of choose whether to wield Conway's law to your advantage rather than uh, yield to it and kind of have it beat you up. So the reason that's kind of relevant for SOAs and service architectures is if you try and align the boundaries of your teams with the boundaries of your components, then you're going to have a better time than if you try to have components that are shared by multiple teams, for example. And part of it is embracing the fact that your teams aren't going to be as good as communicating across team boundaries as they are communicating inside of a team and kind of saying that's okay and not working the same way across teams as you would within teams, not just in the way you, the team members communicate, but also in the way that you integrate services from different teams. Yeah, I think the way that I initially heard it described was that the structure of the application will mirror the communication between the teams. Right, right. And and so there's this thing that I think Netflix originally popularized this idea, and Amazon also, they structure their teams to mirror what they want their architecture to be, to kind of push the architecture in the right direction. So Amazon, for example, have this idea of a two-pizza team where, you know, if their teams are a bit too big that they can't be fed with, like, two large pizzas, then they want to break that team apart. And I'm pretty sure part of the reason why they do that is so that they can, because it forces them into an architectural pattern of small decoupled services which can evolve independently. That's a good thing from a from a technical point of view. So they're doing this interesting thing, and Netflix does the same thing of structuring their teams to kind of let the architecture naturally evolve rather than like fighting against the structure of the teams. So uh, how do we structure our SOA so that we can take advantage of this kind of phenomenon? I'd put it the other way around and I'd say, how do we set up our teams and how they communicate to kind of embrace the nature of the architecture we want? So one of the things that I, I talked about in this talk was talking about kind of being able to work on your code in isolation. So let's imagine you're, you're writing a Rails app, which is backed by a bunch of services. So for example, you're building an e-commerce app and you've got like the front end is Rails, but like when it wants to list the deals of the day, it has to go to the deals of the day service. And when it wants to get the product images to put in that deals of the day section of the page, it has to go off to some like catalog service or something like that. Now, in a lot of cases, if in a larger kind of enterprisey landscape, those services are going to be managed by different teams. And what I've seen happen a lot in the past is particularly as people move from monoliths into these services, service shaped worlds, and, and particularly as teams start to, as organizations grow and they start to break up into multiple teams, at first you just want to stand up the whole stack and run the whole stack together and, and kind of, because it's actually easier that way, right? A monolith is actually pretty easy to work with because you just pick it up and move it in one big chunk and uh, everyone has the same monolith and it, it, it's quite easy to manage. But that doesn't scale in terms of teams. It doesn't scale technically as well, but it doesn't scale in terms of teams. So what you end up starting to do is break up into, into multiple teams that own multiple services. But now if you have those kind of those services coupled together in that you can't stand up the Rails app without those services being there, then now your teams are coupled together. So now every time the green team introduces a bug, the red team get really mad about it, right? Because now the red team who are looking after the Rails app can't even launch their application because the deal service is down again. Oh, those guys don't know what they're doing. So I, I don't know, like I've, I work quite a lot in larger organizations and that's like a very, very common phenomenon is, is people beating up on other teams because their services are down and, oh, those guys are such a bunch of jokers. They're, you know, 
their thing is, is down like twice a day, that kind of stuff. So rather than fighting against that and saying, we've got to make sure that everyone's service is up all the time. Instead, I think it's, it's useful to look at how to isolate yourselves in some aspects of your work so that you don't rely on every one of your dependencies. In your talk, you describe this as the difference between codependence and independence. Yeah. Yeah. So codependence is this kind of like, you know, everyone has to be here for us to do anything kind of phenomenon. Right. And it's great when you can do it. Like if you can inside of a team, you're codependent. Right. So inside of your team that's building your, your software, it totally makes sense for you to be codependent because you get a lot of benefits from that. You, you have a really high bandwidth communication when, when you're breaking each other's stuff. It's actually quite good because it forces you to talk to each other. The problem is if you kind of stick your fingers in your ears and say, Oh, well, this will work exactly the same, even though the other team is on a different floor of the building or is in a different continent, maybe. So in that case, you want to be independent from those teams. I would argue it doesn't mean that you can't be friends. It doesn't mean that you can't collaborate together. But it means not kind of kidding yourselves that you're going to work exactly the same way with someone in um, another country as you would with someone who sits next to you and you have a stand-up with them every day. Or even someone on a different release schedule, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, very, very good point. So decoupling the teams means that you can decouple the services and vice versa. And that means that when you're ready to roll out your software, you're not held up because some other team slipped because they had some bugs they weren't expecting or has different set of priorities. That's the other thing that you see with different teams is they have different priorities, which comes down to kind of organizational management-y stuff, but it still it kicks in, right? Like if one of your dependencies can't release something because they've had some red-hot high-priority issue come in from somewhere else in your organization. If that stops you from releasing, then now you're kind of coupled to random parts of the of the organizational structure that you don't want to be. So what are some of the things that you can do to move towards codependence? Do you mean codependence or independence? Sorry, independence, yes. Yeah. So it's about decoupling, and that's about kind of looking at where you have those dependencies on a service being up, for example, or on a service being at the same version as you, and then uh, using techniques to break that dependence. So one of the techniques that we use a lot around test automation is to create kind of fake versions of our dependent services. So in almost every project I've been on, we've, we've done this at some point where, you know, if, if we require the deals of the day service to be up in order to launch the home page, at some point, we build a fake deals of the day service that always returns just kind of some generic data. And, and initially, that might just be used for manual testing, just so that you can stand up the Rails app on your laptop without having to stand up the entire kind of enterprise infrastructure on your laptop. But quite quickly, what you can get to is starting to use those fake services for testing as well, because obviously, you want to make sure that Yes, you want to be independent from teams that aren't necessarily sitting right next to you, but at the end of the day, you're releasing a product that is the, the combination of all of these different services and all of these different teams. So you do need to be able to, to verify that you can work together nicely. And so faking out services is one way to do that. So you can, you can simulate, for example, let's say you are getting ready for your, your winter holiday sale. And you know that uh, during the holidays, the deals of the day is going to have 20 items in it rather than 10 items. If you wanted to test that and you were only using the real deals of the day service, you'd have to kind of figure out how to configure it and get it set up in some environment somewhere and test it. Alternatively, if you're using fake versions of those services, then you can just stand up this fake version and configure it to kind of simulate the scenario that you want to configure. So it's actually really beneficial as well in terms of being able to test kind of edge cases and scenarios that shouldn't happen, but eventually will happen. So the idea of faking it makes a lot of sense to me, but at some point you do have to test it against the actual service, right? To make sure that it works, you know, the way you think it works. And I think that's called contract tests. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so contract tests is this idea that the challenge uh, as you're saying, where if you're testing it's a fake version of the service is you're essentially testing against your understanding of how this other service works. So because you're not actually talking to the blue team's deal service, if they change the way their deal service works, or if you just misunderstand how it works in the first place, and they start returning date times as um, seconds from the epoch rather than ISO 8601 or something like that, if they change the format of their data structures or they add a field or they remove field, you're not going to know from your fake services because your fake services are, are fake, right? They're not the real deal. So one of the antidotes to that is to write contract tests. Um, these are also sometimes described as consumer-driven contracts. And the idea there is the consumer of the service writes tests against that service 
that kind of basically encapsulate what they expect that service to do. So they're kind of like a contract between the two. They become a contract between the two teams, essentially, where the consumer of the service kind of gives these tests to the provider of the service and says, if you can get all these tests to pass, then as far as I'm concerned, you are doing everything I need from you as a service. So we might write some tests that make sure that when we call the deals of the day, it comes back with these values, or if it's like a a login service, then we write some tests where we give it some good username and password and make sure it comes back with the expected response, and a bad username and password and make sure it comes back with the expected response. So it's a, this is a way to kind of encapsulate a kind of a communication mechanism between the two teams where you write the tests and, and give them to the team and then the team knows whether they're, the tests are working or not. My uh, experience with building fakes like this has been kind of mixed because I have memories of spending a lot of time just maintaining the fakes. Yeah. Keeping them synced up with their real counterparts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just sinking a lot of time into that. Have you come up with any, any strategies for minimizing the time spent on that? I, I definitely have felt that pain as well. There's a, a more sophisticated variant of the consumer contracts thing where you essentially you insert a shim in between your service or sorry, your code. Like, let's say if you're a Rails app, you're, you're, you're the kind of the client and the service. And it's kind of like an HTTP proxy of some kind. And what that will do is it will record the requests coming out and be able to play them back at a later point. You can then use that same shim to verify your contract tests and use the output of those contract tests as the input for your fakes. So this this is definitely kind of like pretty high grade sophistication. Like I've actually never done this because uh, it's it's a lot of moving parts, but it's become a bit simpler in the last couple of years. There's a couple of gems released by a couple of teams. So there's a gem called Pact, P-A-C-T, and there's another gem called Pacto. And both of those are tools that you can use to do this kind of consumer contracts that also provide fakes. So they're kind of two-faced, if you will. They're, they're, as far as the consumer is concerned, they're providing a fake service. And then as far as the provider is concerned, they're providing a set of contract tests against that provider. And I think that they're used by fairly large organizations. So Pact is used by REA, which is one of the biggest. It's like the real estate company in Australia, as far as I understand. Maybe Pact or maybe Pacto. I get the two mixed up. And then the other one is used by Rackspace a lot to test their APIs for their OpenStack stuff, I believe. So effectively, the fake is able to test its own assumptions about the real thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a really cool idea. I haven't used it myself in anger, but I know that there's ThoughtWorks teams that have had a lot of success with it. So, Well, ThoughtWorks is listed as an author on Pacto. Yeah. I'm curious. So I've done this, but I've also done, or at least built fakes, like what Avdi was saying. I've built fakes and then had to maintain them. I've also just used something like VCR. Mm-hmm. And fake web to basically record a response and then just play it back. The problem I've run into with that is that if the API changes, then you have to re-record. And a lot of times you have to wind up sending it a different set of data. And so your assumption changing, you know, creates a whole lot of work and you have to maintain basically your recipe for getting a recorded response. I'm just curious, when would you use something like this with a fake service and when would you actually go ahead and use something like VCR where it's just, hey, I think I know what the response is going to be. Yeah. Fundamentally, they're, they're kind of the same idea. It's just really, it's so the distinction I, I make, which I'm not sure if it really makes that much difference, but there's kind of in process versus out of process. So things like VCR and WebMock are running in the same process as your Ruby app, but you're still doing the same thing as these out of process tools where you're essentially just sticking something in between the client and the server and kind of simulating either recording and playing back or just kind of simulating uh, the responses. I think in different technology stacks, it's it's quite nice to be able to share the same thing between technology stacks. So for example, if you're, if you're building an iPhone app or a Android app or your, or some of your consumers are are Java and some of them are Erlang or whatever, then using an out of process tool means that you can share that tool across those different tech stacks because those out of process tools are just using HTTP. The flip side of them is that you have less control of them during tests because you do, you can't just reach directly into the thing that's running the the tool. So it's kind of it's kind of trade offs. I'm I end up preferring out of process ones just because they feel like they're testing more of the system. But I think it really depends on your context. If you're a Ruby shop and and you're just doing Ruby, then using something in process like VCR is actually would work just fine as well. 
So in the scenario that you created in your talk, each service is run by a different team, right? So you had the products team running the product service, the deals team running the deal service, and then you're in the middle, you know, switching between the two and you're the Rails app. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the communication between you and the services is done via just code, right? And, and tests and specs and contract tests and such. When is that not enough? When, if ever, do you need to actually go to the other floor or across the building <laughs> and like sit down and have a real conversation? When is that more useful? Always. Every single time. <laughs> That's a great question. So as software people, we want to solve all of our problems with technology because we don't want to have to interact with people, right? This is true. (laughs) So this is something that I spend a lot of my time doing is telling people to get up and walk over there and talk to the person. (laughs) So it's always better to have a, a more high bandwidth form of communication, right? And having a conversation with someone about this stuff is way more useful overall i would always prefer that but it's not an and it's not an or it's an and so you can choose to do both the place where these kind of tools are, are very helpful are instances where i don't know if i'm taking off my kind of diplomatic consulting hat for a second instances where you have to kind of hit the other team over the head with the truth uh, and they don't believe you so a lot of times, particularly if it's a team that you don't haven't had the opportunity to kind of build any kind of personal communication with, if you tell them like, hey, every now and then your your deal service is returning things with, with a missing field, they'll probably not believe you and they'll just say, oh, you're probably calling us wrong. That's almost always the case, right? They'll they'll say, oh, well, you're probably just calling us with some invalid data. Works on um, my machine. Exactly. Because that's another part of being a software developer is we're pretty convinced that we're better than everyone else, right? Like it's uh, despite in- imposter syndrome, I think there's always an assumption that we understand things, and so if someone else thinks that something's broken, it's probably because they don't understand things as well as I do. Uh, so one of the really nice things about these contract tests is they kind of help to solve this game of whose bug is it anyway, where you know everyone insists that their code is doing the right thing and it must be someone else's problem. And there's a lot of kind of finger pointing, not necessarily in a like a kind of toxic, aggressive way, just in a natural kind of assumption way. Like I'm busy, I'm not sure whose problem it is, I'm pretty sure my stuff's good, so I'm just going to assume it's someone else's problem. And you get this kind of tragedy of the commons where everyone thinks it's someone else's fault and no one fixes the problem. Contract tests are really good because they very reliably test the same thing over and over again, and they produce a lot of kind of documentation about what was sent to the service and what its response was. So I've had real life examples where in a project where we had a a service that was consistently kind of challenged, we got to the point where the CI system would run these tests on a regular basis, like maybe every hour. And when they broke, we'd notice that the build had turned red We'd go to the CI thing, we'd be like, oh, there it is, deal service again, copy paste the output from CI into an email and send a nice email to the team saying, we're pretty sure that we're using your service wrong. It must be our fault. But when we ask you for the deals of the day, you're returning a 500 error. So that is actually really helpful because it helps that team debug the issue, right? They've got a really solid reproduction case rather than us just saying, sometimes your service doesn't work properly and we're not sure why. I love the way you phrased that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's me putting my consulting hat back on again. Well, and you you kind of framed the conversation around this a little bit, but you know, by bringing up Conway's law, but at the same time, it's funny how we talk about these technical issues around consuming services and building services, and what we're talking about is how to talk between the teams, how to facilitate the communication. Yeah. And how that Facilitating that communication is what makes the technical issues work themselves out. Yep. Yep. And this is, so this is a really, this is a total sidebar, but this highlights why things like improving the diversity of, of our industry is super, super valuable because diverse people have different ways of talking to each other and uh, they can actually communicate with each other better. Having five different people that have five different backgrounds that have five different communication styles, one of them will be able to relate to the other person on the other team and and have a conversation. And building software is a team sport. Maybe it didn't used to be, but it's absolutely a team sport and it comes down to to people all the time. So if you can have a a good team that can communicate with each other, then that trumps uh, algorithmic efficiency every day of the week, in my opinion. The thing is, is if you, you know, algorithmic efficiency, you'll save money at scale, you know, however big the system is, it's going to save you that much money. 
But in my opinion, most systems, some call the same call. And so, you know, you'll save thousands and thousands of dollars by making that change. But that's at scale. On most systems that I've worked on, you know, they're not at that scale. So the big expense isn't the infrastructure, it's the people. Right. And so if you can get them to communicate so they're not spending as much time banging their heads against the wall, that's where you're going to save money. Or that's where you're going to get more done. You know, you're going to get further ahead of your competitors and be more competitive and things like that. And so, I mean, ultimately, what we're talking about here really does affect the bottom line of the companies that you're working for as well. I mean, that's the fundamental argument of, of Ruby, right, is a developer productivity trumps CPU efficiency. Like, I'd rather have an effective team than, than an effective program. If you're able to, in general, produce software faster, that gives you way more time to do the profiling to find the one part of your code base that needs to be optimized and then spend the time optimizing it. So you actually end up with a more effective code base anyway if you're doing it right. Yep, totally agree. Is there any other aspect of kind of the the social or team dynamic people problem things that we should talk about before we get into the technical details of how this all kind of sits and hangs together? The only other thing I'd, I'd highlight is that it's important to understand once you get to this level of having different kinds of tests, you've got like your... Uh, unit test, and then you've got kind of some isolated tests that are using these fake services, and then you've got your contract tests, et cetera, et cetera. It's important to uh, start looking at this as a, uh, start introducing some of the concepts of continuous delivery and look at this as a pipeline that your software is going through. And as, as you check in code, you start off with just the unit tests. And then the analogy that Jez Humble, the guy that wrote the CD book, uses is it's kind of like you're putting your code through like a, uh, like a, an assault course and the, the obstacles are getting higher and higher as it goes. So it's, you start it off by just seeing if it can pass its unit tests. And then you start, and then you say, okay, great. Well, you can pass a unit test. How about your isolated functional tests? Okay, good. Now are you able to communicate with this other system and kind of setting it up as a series of more complex tests and tests that are more integrated as you go? means that you get fast feedback early on if it's your bug, uh, but you'll get feedback on the integrated system uh, quickly as well. So just using these tools and then running them ad hoc is better than nothing, but you really get the most bang for your buck out of it if you're able to run them on a very consistent basis and run them when your code changes and run them when the other person's code changes so that you can you can see the delta and get faster feedback. I also want to point out that during your talk, you kept picking on Team D, and I kept thinking to myself, yeah, they're definitely not the A team. They're the D team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've actually, I, I kind of, I, I exaggerate, you know, for effect with this stuff. But I've very rarely worked with teams that don't want to do a good job, right? Like, and and they're not like it's very rarely that the team isn't capable or isn't smart. It's normally that they've got other stuff going on, right? Like. The reason their stuff is breaking is because they're under a huge crunch in some other part of the code they maintain, and they're just not paying attention to, to this stuff because it's not on their radar right now. So it, it's generally it's generally not like Team D are the, yeah. are the dummies, but it's fun to turn it into a joke, especially when it's an anonymized team like Team D. No one really cares about Team D. Yeah, well, the other thing is is that you're not going to get anywhere even if they are kind of the guys that are a little bit slow. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you come in and you're like, okay, you idiots, you know, let's, let's get this working. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, and, and we've kind of discussed that already, but I mean... Yeah, I think we all have our egos and, you know, as you said, we all kind of think we're right. And so it's really easy to go in and just assume that they did something dumb. And sometimes it is some dumb little syntax error or something. But if you haven't ever done that, come find me because I want to hire right. you, okay? Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about the, the technical end of this. You recommended that people use Faraday. Do you want to explain just a little bit about what Faraday is and, and how yeah. people use it? So Faraday is kind of like Rack, but upside down is kind of how I would describe it. So so Rack is this system that kind of underpins your Rails app. It underpins almost every HTTP app that you would do in Ruby. And it's this kind of abstraction over the concept of HTTP. So uh, requests come in and responses come out, and you can kind of have those. You assemble this kind of stack of middlewares, and they each, as a request comes in, it passes through each layer of that stack, and that stack is able to kind of modify that request in some way or to take some action based on that request. Uh, eventually, that request gets to your Rails app, which, in fact, your Rails app is, consists of like a ton of different rack middlewares. That's actually internally how it's structured these days. 
so you you know eventually this request comes through this stack of middlewares gets processed by your business logic and then heads out back down the stack the kind of the same way it went in and on the way out all those pieces of middleware are also able to modify the response in some way so uh, uh, this is the way that you do kind of like logging and uh, maybe enforce like security you put some authentication thing in there and add extra headers and compress your compress your assets and all that kind of stuff can be done by modifying the request as it comes in and modifying the response as it comes out. So that's Rack. Faraday is the exact same concept, but as for the client side of things rather than the server side of things. So it's the same idea of this stack of middlewares, but instead of it being on the server, it's on the client. So when I make a request as a client, when I make a request to some remote server, my request won't go on the wire straight away. It will first travel through this stack of middlewares, which are, again, able to modify that request on the way out. That request then goes to that external service. The external service does whatever it's going to do, sends a response back, and then as the response comes back in, again, my stack of middlewares, my Faraday middleware, is able to modify that response as it comes back in. It's very, very similar. It's a really, really elegant way of splitting your application into the boring, techy network stuff, versus the interesting business domain-y stuff. And Rails uses this to great, to great effect with Rack on the server side of things. Faraday lets you use the same techniques on the client side of things to keep your kind of business logic focused on the business and keep your boring networky stuff like logging requests and compressing things and parsing and all that kind of stuff isolated from, from the business logic. Yeah, I tend to uh, explain middleware as lenses or filters. And... You know, so some things are going to filter different colors or different shapes or different things like that. So different parts of the request going out or coming in uh, or response going out and coming in. And so in a lot of cases, it's just going to leave it alone. And then in some cases, it's actually going to handle change or otherwise manage the information that is going past it. And so it goes all the way to the bottom and then climbs all the way back out. Yeah, exactly. And and Faraday works in that exact same way of kind of. It's kind of a classic pipes and filters kind of Unix type mm-hmm. type dealio. And if, you know, if people who've had the curse of working in Java, uh, it's like serverless. I mean, it's a very common pattern in, in a bunch of different uh, technology stacks, actually. Yeah, and with Rack, it's requests coming in and responses going out, and with Faraday, it's requests going out and then responses coming back. Yeah, and it's a lot easier if you look at a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, how does this fit into your SOA systems? This is kind of coming a lot from a specific project where I used Faraday and was really, really happy with it. So we wanted in this project to uh, stick with this kind of idea of hexagonal architectures. With the, This is the idea of basically keeping your core business domain, like the reason your app is actually doing something, separate from all of the boring technical goop. Your goal is to kind of push all of the techie stuff like hitting the database or rendering HTML or making network calls out to the boundaries of the system and then establish a really nice defined boundary, I guess, in between the techie stuff, the network calls, the HTTP, the database, etc., and the businessy stuff. And the way that we did that was building these things called service gateways uh, which are kind of like equivalent to like a repository if you're talking to a database or maybe kind of like an active record object, but for, for service calls. Uh, so we built these service gateways, one for each external service we were using, and the way that those internally were built was using Faraday uh, as, a, as the client. So one thing that I've done with this kind of thing is actually build a kind of an internal gem that codifies how to talk to the external service and then test that gem against the testing system and stuff. And so I'd have a gem that basically wraps around Faraday and defines all of the middleware that goes in there so that it does the right thing when it's, you know, making the request and then coming back as far as logging and everything else because it can vary from service to service. Is that an approach that you've used, or do you just use Faraday and and set things up on a per-request basis? I've not gone to the extent of actually using the gem mechanism to kind of package it kind of as a, as a separate module. We definitely would treat it as um, an independent kind of library that we we want to be able to exist in isolation. Like we don't want it, the implementation of this thing shouldn't be coupled to any other part of the application. So you should be able to test it in isolation. And we did do that. We actually, often we would use the 
service gateways as the uh, the start of our contract tests. So that was a nice way for us to test our service gateways at the same time as testing our external services. We, we essentially considered the service gateway to be kind of part of that integration with the external service. And maybe if, if it was a, a larger system or if it was something that was more complex kind of architecturally, then we would have pulled out those service gateways into independent gems. For our use case, it was enough just to have them as just plain old Ruby classes that we were able to use in both our tests and also in our production code, obviously. Yeah, in the case that, that I'm thinking of, basically, it, it was just a convenient way to share code. You know, we had several client services, so to speak, that would all speak to the same backend service. Yeah. And so, so, so there's one that, that actually touches on a really interesting point that kind of takes us back to Conway's law. There's always a strong temptation to have the team that maintains the service build these gateways. So if I'm the deals of the day service, I build the deals of the day service gateway and package it up as a gem. And then I just dump that gem. You know, get, I export that gem into my, or consumers of my service can just pull that gem in. That feels like the right thing to do. It's actually going to cause you, I think, most of the time, more pain than benefit. And again, it goes back to Conway's law. If you think about where the team boundaries are versus where the code boundaries are, you've now got some other team inserting, coupling themselves directly into one of the really important parts of your code base. And so now, every time you want to change, every time that team wants to change how they're doing things, they need to change your code. And that can really lead to teams that are very very tightly coupled together. And if they're not able to communicate effectively, then it will cause more pain than good, in my opinion. But it's very counterintuitive because it feels like a much more efficient way of doing things. Right, but the team that's that's implementing that service, they don't necessarily understand how you want to use the service. Right. And if there's different teams using the service in different ways, then by having one team kind of define, like, the way of talking to the service that now that team is responsible for the kind of the union of all possible use cases of the service. And that can put a lot of burden on the other team. That's a really interesting point. Uh, Thankfully in, in my, in that case, we were all the same team working on all the different services. So it was less of an issue there. Yeah. Yeah. I could go, I could walk around the pod of desks and Hey, you broke it. Yep. Yeah, and in, and in that case, it absolutely makes sense because if you're not kind of pushing against the grain in terms of the team structure and the and the code structure, then then go for it. But it's it's when you notice a, a distance between the way the teams work and the way the code works, that's when kind of alarm bells should be ringing. Yeah. So you're using Faraday. You have these services set up. We talked a little bit about testing it before, but how do you verify that the whole system is playing nicely together? Do you recommend that people set up like a a staging uh, setup and test it that way? Or is there a different approach that you recommend there? It's kind of tricky. At some point, it gets back to that continuous delivery idea. To start with, maybe you want to test these things against fake services just to make sure that they're fundamentally working. The next thing you probably want to do is stand up. If you can, my preference is to stand up a kind of a disposable environment, essentially, of all of the services that the immediate services that you depend upon and test those integrations and then just throw that environment away when you're done. And, you know, if you've got things like Vagrant and Docker there and Chef and Puppet, then this makes that kind of practice a little bit easier. Realistically, for most larger kind of service architectures, what you end up doing pretty quickly is integrating by putting everything into a shared kind of integration environment or staging environment and then running a lighter set of tests against that staging environment. But what you really don't want to do is, is use that staging environment to test the functionality of your application. You should have already verified the functionality of your code uh, using unit tests and lower level tests. You should only really be using that staging environment to test that the integrations that you've built work in the way that you expect them to work. So does it make sense to have a shared dev environment and a shared staging environment? So it, it, a shared dev environment, I think, is sustainable for a period of time. But at some point, if you have enough teams sharing that environment something is always broken. If you're doing a good job as a software engineer, you're, you're breaking stuff at some point, right? Like if nothing's ever broken, then you're probably not, you're not, probably not working hard enough, in my opinion. So the, the challenge with a shared environment is eventually it gets to at the point that so many teams are committing code to that shared environment so fast that it's often broken. And once you get to that point, then I've seen a lot of teams move towards standing up 
their own versions of their own kind of environments that have copies of their dependent services. So, you know, if, if it's the team that's building the, the e-commerce app, they might have a shared kind of front end set of services, but they're all talking to the same SAP installation or something like that, because it doesn't make sense to have an, a, an SAP installation per developer, but it also probably doesn't make sense to have an SAP installation that's shared across every developer in a large organization, because at some point, two developers are going to want a different version of something to be there. So you start having to have kind of a series of, of shared environments. Yeah, it, it also sounds, though, that you're almost getting to where, I don't know, you have to do these big planned releases then instead of, in, you know, instead of so just this deploying is, so, one at a time because you do have that interdependence then instead of independence. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's really, really good point. So, so that, that gets to something which I actually didn't talk about at this talk because I didn't have time. The idea of feature flags and being able to release latent code. So code that is there and ready to go, but hasn't been turned on yet. And that's the best way I've seen to decouple releases from each other. So I think when, when you guys had the episode with Badri and, and Mo talking about extreme deployments, I'm doing air quotes. Uh, or ex- was it extreme deployment? That was what you guys called it, right? Yep. I think there was a, they touched briefly on this idea of feature flags or feature bits or feature toggles where you have code that's, uh, so let's say you're integrating with a new, so the deals of the day team have been hard at work and they're, they're getting ready to release deals of the day version two. It's a greenfield re-implementation of deals of the day in Rust. And you want to use this new service and they have guaranteed that it's going to be delivered in next month's release. Uh, so you build code that's coupled to that service being there. If that service isn't there, then you can't release your code. So that's the thing that you don't want to happen, right? Is you're coupled to this release because if they, if their deadline slips or if they have some other priority they need to do and their new service doesn't get out or their new version of the service doesn't get out, then now you can't get out either. The way to get around that and the general approach to solve this is to use a feature flag and be able to turn it off and on. So your code ships with the latent ability to use the new deals of the day service, but it still has the ability to use the old deals of the day service. And that means that if everything goes according to plan, you ship with that feature bit turned on and you can talk to this new Rust powered deals of the day service. But if things go south, then you just ship the same, you, you release the exact same day just as you were planning, you just turn the feature bit off. And then Two weeks later, blue team or whatever the team is, they've pulled the, their all-nighters and they've finally got their Rust service out into production. You just flip your feature bit on and start using a new service. And then a couple of weeks later, you deprecate the code that was using the old service and then you delete it from your, your code base a couple of weeks after that. So that's the way that you decouple the release trains of these different teams. And I used an extreme example of like a brand new service, but you can do the exact same thing with an API slightly changing. So it used to be that the first name and last name were two separate fields, and now they're one field joined together. You can use feature flags to control how you consume that service's API so that if their release doesn't go out, then you're not going to break. Nice. I like it. So have you built any apps that rely solely on services? In other words, there's no database. The database is that other service? Yeah, so that was actually the case with the app that was the inspiration for a lot of this, the app where we used a lot of Faraday. That was the first app I've worked on, I think, or the first Rails app I've worked on where there was literally no database at all. It was all back-end services. So, and it, and it was an e-commerce app. It was for an online book retailer. And yeah, they had a bunch of existing services in Java and .NET, and they wanted to build a nice API, a nice UI to release to um, a new geography. And so... We built this Rails app that was, we literally deleted active record, the active record gem from the gem file, which was very satisfying. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's a flag for that, right? Yeah, I was, I don't know, I I got some catharsis from deleting active record. Yeah. And it, it was really interesting, right? Because you get all of these weird, there's a lot of stuff that you have to look at in terms of making a Rails app performant in that context. So caching, for example, was a really, really big deal for us because every page we rendered involved multiple service calls to services where we had no control over their response times in some cases. And some of the service calls were quite expensive. Looking up a product price is, is surprisingly expensive. 
So we, we put quite a lot of work into figuring out how to get these service gateways, these stacks of, of Faraday components to add kind of performance things like caching without us having to think about it inside of the business code. Again, going back to that hexagonal architectures thing. So that leads me to another question, and that is, is there something that you can build into Faraday to handle unreliable or unresponsive services since you don't have control of service? Yeah, you essentially can make Faraday work like your browser works. So as web developers, if if you're building a Rails app, you understand quite well, hopefully you understand quite well how caching works and you put caching headers, make sure that there's caching headers on your images and figure out how to set your e-tags correctly so that you can send back 304s rather than re-rendering things, all, all that kind of stuff. So we do that a lot as HTTP on the server side of things. We do that because the browser is optimized quite heavily, very heavily to do caching. So a browser will try really hard to not make a network request. And if it is going to make a network request, it will try very hard to use what it's got in its cache rather than actually pulling all of the data down over the wire. So we configured Faraday to do the same thing. We essentially set up Faraday to be a little mini web browser where each gateway had an internal cache and it would try really hard to respect the caching headers that it was getting back from the services that we were using. So, for example, product prices are very, very dynamic. They'll change multiple times a day in some cases, so they're not very cacheable. Product information, the title of a book, an ISBN, is obviously very, very static. It very rarely changes. So our services would send back caching headers that kind of encapsulated that. So our services would, the ser- when we made a service call to get product details, it would have quite a long cache time because it doesn't change that often. Conversely, the pricing service would have cache headers that basically said, don't, tr- don't cache me. You need to call me every time. Sorry, but prices change a lot. And we were able to set up a Faraday stack that would use those caching headers to cache information. And what was really, really nice about this is it put control of the cacheability of data with the team that owned that data. Again, goes back to Conway's law, right? Like, as a consumer of the service, I know less about its cacheability than the provider. Like, the pricing service, they know how often their prices change, so they should be the guys that say how cacheable it is. Likewise, the product team, they know how to build an e-tag that represents the, that resource, so they should be the ones building it, and we should just be kind of following their lead as a team. So setting up the architecture that way, Again, like lined up the team boundaries with the technical boundaries. And then do you just split out? So when I request a book, it didn't come with the price included. So I'd have to go to the pricing endpoint and ask for that just because it had a different life cycle than the rest of the book information. Yep, that's actually a fairly common pattern with more sophisticated web applications. Uh, So it's called segmentation by freshness. So if you don't do that, then everything has to be, you kind of get this cascading effect where the entire set of data has to have the cache time of of the most kind of time sensitive thing. So imagine your Twitter feed, for example, when you load the Twitter homepage, the whole homepage can only be cached as long as like there might not be a tweet. But really, the only thing that that changes there is the, the bit in the middle of the tweets. All the rest of it is actually separate. Mm-hmm. So I have some questions about managing this caching. Was this all in memory in your server processes, or did you save off the caches somewhere? So the really weird part about Faraday is it's so similar to Rack that you can actually put this adapter into a Rack middleware and turn it into a Faraday middleware. We were actually using the Rack caching middleware adapted to sit inside of a Faraday stack and that rack caching middleware has a lot of different options for, for storing it. So you can do in memory, you can do on disk, you can do memcached, you can do, I think, Redis. There's like a bunch of different options. In our case, we used the file system because it was easy to set up and just seemed like the simplest way to do it for, to start with. Uh, but we had the option of changing where that caching was stored very, very simply. It's literally just a one-line configuration change inside of the middleware to say, you know, rather than writing to this directory on disk, write to this memcache location. And did you ever have trouble with cache busting? Like uh, um, values that just were stubbornly the cache version when you really wanted the fresh version? I don't think so. We did have issues where we had to talk through with the other teams how to set the headers correctly. We didn't ever have a situation where something was kind of stuck in the cache. In general, we had the other problem where there weren't the caching fragments that we wanted, 
so we weren't using the cache at all. Um, that happened quite a lot, and that was kind of a thing where we had to go to the different teams and say, like, hey, we're respecting caching headers. You should probably use some of those, please. But I, I'm not aware of any issue where kind of stuff got stuck in the cache necessarily. Okay. In reality, most of the time, we would need to go onto the network. There are a few things, like the list of states that you support, right? Stuff like that, uh, you can cache that for quite a while. You could probably cache that for a day, and it's not going to be the end of the world. So there's a few kind of reference services that were, were cached enough that we literally didn't go on the wire if we'd recently seen a new a new version of that that resource. But most of the services were not... We, we would still have to go to the service and ask it if things had changed. But so you're basically t- doing head requests? Yes, exactly, yeah. So you go to the service and ask it. Or you don't even need to do a head request. You can make a regular get. Um, oh, I see, right. Yeah, if it just comes back with a 304, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly, I mean, and again, exactly the same techniques that the browser uses very effectively today. Now, is there a lot of middleware written for Faraday, or did you wind up having to write or adapt your own? There's a fair amount out there. I'm trying to remember if there was a few little pieces that we kind of crafted for ourselves around instrumentation, I think. So tracking how long the requests were taking. And I think we had something that bridged between the Faraday stack and the thing that's built into active support that does instrumentation, uh, active notifications, I think it's called, yeah. something like that. So we had something that we used so that we could centralize all of our instrumentation of how long both our requests and responses were taking and our clients. And that was helpful for kind of correlating what was making a web page load slow. So there's a few little things we had to do like that. In general, the stuff that comes out of the box with Faraday, there's there's like some stuff that comes with Faraday by default. And then there's a set, there's a gem that has like a set of extensions uh, and useful kind of bits and bobs for Faraday, the name of which I can't remember. Um, but generally, we just used the sort of standard middleware components in most cases. All right. Well, if people want to get a hold of you or ask you questions about this, Pete, what's the best way to do that? I am on the Twitters as at PH1, and I am on email as P Hodgson, P-H-O-D-G-S-O-N, at fortworks.com. And yeah, I love, love, love talking about this stuff, and if anyone's interested in debating it or talking about it more, I'd, I'd love to talk more about it. It's it's something I'm super passionate about. Yep, and if you want to hear Pete every week talk about iOS stuff, you can also go <laughs> to iFreaksShow.com. That's right. All right, well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Saran, do you want to start us off with the picks? Sure. I have a lot of picks today, actually. So the first pick is Pete's talk, Rails as a SOA client. That was the one talk at RailsConf that I was very, very upset with myself that I missed because it was really good and I got a chance to watch it to prepare for the show. And I thought the way you explained things was just really beautiful and the way you explained hexagonal architecture with like the picture and you kind of led up to that. I, I thought, honestly, it was beautiful storytelling. So I went Thank you. You're very welcome. The second, you mentioned diversity and how important it is in, in teams. And uh, one of my picks is actually a blog post called Diversity is a Superpower. And I feel like a lot of times when I read blog posts on diversity, it's usually an anecdotal story or just, you know, a personal experience thing. And this one was actually very, very fact uh, and like research based, which I really, really liked. And it talks about a lot of concrete, tangible benefits of diversity and it research and it um, cites different research papers on what you should know about it and how it impacts your work. So I really like the different angle and perspective on talking about diversity. And I think you will, too. The third is a study group called Ruby Newbies, and it started by Brian Douglas, who actually had on the Code Newbie podcast. He's a Rails developer, and they are a group that does different parts of Newbie, and if you're a little bit new, I think you'll appreciate it. They're going to be reading the Pooter book starting October 7, and they meet twice a month, and I think that'll be a great place for you to start if you haven't read Pooter yet. My fourth pick is about cartooning. So if you've seen any of my talks and you've seen that I love to put comics and cartoons in my slides and people often ask me, you know, how to draw and how can they do that? And actually Chuck asked me this a couple of weeks ago. And so there's this course that Rachel Neighbors, who's a cartoonist and an interaction developer, is putting on called Cartooning for Tech Folk. And I thought you'd be interested in that. And the final pick that I have is called Octobuild, and it's by a developer Richard Littor, and the idea is, it's kind of like NaNoWriMo, if you've heard of that before, which is the challenge to write a novel in the month of November, and this is the challenge to start and hopefully finish some kind of a programming project in the month of October, and it's a board, you post up the project, you can ask for help, it's a great place to ask for support and collaboration, 
And so if there's an idea or a side project you've been thinking about and need a reason to get started, here's your reason. And I'm going to join and I, I'm excited to, to see everyone's projects. That's all I got. Awesome. Avdi, what are your picks? You know what? I got nothing this time. Sorry. Slacker. Did you I know. take all of your picks, Avdi? <laughs> yeah, I, I seed my picks. You took all of his picks. He was I totally going to pick the October developer thing. I knew it. I Sorry, Avdi. Next week. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I've got a couple of picks. They're both books. One of them is called Finding Ultra. I might have picked it on the show before, but I don't think I did, so I'm going to pick it again. And basically, it's this guy. He's 40-something. He has trouble walking up the stairs, kind of has a shortness of breath, you know, and kind of this moment of, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die, and then realizes that I really don't want to die. And so he goes through and starts training for an ultra Iron Man, and then it talks about, you know, the process that he goes through basically changing his life. And so there's a lot in there about veganism and stuff. And I just kind of, I thought, okay, that's interesting and got some ideas from it, but I'm not going vegan. However, there was also just a lot of terrific go out and empower yourself and change your life in it. And so I, I really liked it. The other book I'm going to pick is there's a new book out in the Michael Vay series, which I have picked on the show before. Michael Vay and Hunt for Jade Dragon. If you want kind of a, I'm not really going to think about this story, it's young adult fiction, so not a tremendously wonderful book, but I really did enjoy it, and I think it's the best one in the series so far. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm liking that. And then my third book pick is The Maze Runner. They're turning it into a movie. And again, it's I like it about the same as I like Michael Vay, so it's not my favorite book, but I am enjoying it. So anyway, those are my picks. Uh, Pete, what are your picks? Uh, my first pick is going to be Shameless Self-Promotion. We talked a little bit about this idea of feature flags and being able to ship code that's on or off depending on uh, kind of a toggle. Me and a coworker made a gem probably a couple of years ago now called uh, Rack Flags, which lets you do feature flagging in a very lightweight way. You don't need a database. You don't need anything else. You just need to stick this thing into your rack stack, and it lets you do really basic lightweight feature flagging. Uh, so it's a good way to get started looking at that technique. So uh, Rack Flags is my first pick. My second pick is the Gogoruko conference that just wrapped up last week, I think, in San Francisco. And uh, I didn't go this year, and I'm super sad I didn't because they announced that it was the last year they're going to do it. It's been one of my favorite tech conferences for, I've been like a, a few times, and it's just a really, really great conference. They do, they did a really, really great job with that conference. So kind of bittersweet that they, that they're wrapping it up, but just wanted to give them some love because uh, they did a lot of hard work. And I know that running a conference is not uh, an easy or, necessarily uh, hugely rewarding in terms of money uh, activity so lots of love to them uh, continuing on the on the the love in theme uh, i'm going to pick ruby rogues i've been listening to this show since episode 1 i think uh, i haven't listened to every episode but it's just been one of my favorite podcasts and you guys always have really interesting guests and very very smart panelists so thank you for doing uh, what you do for 176 episodes well, thanks uh, yeah my last pick is is a beer because i like to pick beers I'm going to pick Upright 4, which is a Saison wheat beer from Upright Brewing, who are based in Portland, Oregon. It's a really nice, light, very refreshing, low alcohol, but very full of kind of interesting flavors beer. Uh, I highly recommend it if you can get hold of it. Upright 4. Hey, I realized I had a pick after all. All your book picks, Chuck, made me realize I have a book pick. Uh, one of my favorite book series is the, uh, the Laundry series by Charles Strauss. And it's hard, a little hard to describe. It's basically if you take HP Lovecraft and cross it with XKCD and Dilbert, you get the laundry series. The, the basic premise is that the sort of cosmological horrors hinted at in HP Lovecraft are totally real and totally, you know, interested in munching on everybody on Earth. And magic is basically computational, advanced computation. And so computer programmers tend to be the ones that get sucked into to fighting these beasties. The novels are written from the perspective of somebody who was a programmer and got sort of sucked into the agency that's responsible for keeping Earth safe from these critters. But rather than being like an exciting, you know, men in black, big shiny guns kind of agency it turns out that this agency is exactly like every other government agency so it's mired in bureaucracy <laughs> and it's full of cubicles and you know when he's not fighting tentacled horrors he's having to install new cabling because he also doubles his it 
And uh, it's written by somebody who is, I guess, one of us would be the right way to put it. So it is just riddled with references that you will get if you are a geek and a programmer. Uh, it's a lot of fun. That sounds awesome. It really does. I also forgot to mention, if you are thinking about going freelancing, going freelance, the Freelancer Show panelists are doing a Q&A on freelancing, and you can go sign up for that at freelancersanswers.com. And it's going to be live. It'll be on October 7th, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. We'll basically take any questions that people have about marketing, lifestyle, freelancing, all that stuff. So if you're interested, then go pick that up. The other thing that I keep getting asked about is podcasting. It seems like I've coached about four people in the last week, present company included. And, you know, I, I love doing it. I think I might be able to help more people if I do the same kind of thing. And so I'm going to give kind of an introduction and then answer whatever questions people have. And I'm not sure when I'm going to do that, but you can go sign up for that at pickuppodcasting.com. So anyway, kind of some self-promotion, but hopefully I can help some folks out. They're going to be free, so I don't feel bit too bad about promoting it, but there you go. Can I self-promote too? Yes. Noel Rapp and pinged me on Twitter and said, hey, by my calculation, today is the two-year anniversary of the first episode of Ruby Tapas. And I was like, holy crap, it is. So, yeah, that's I'm just going to say I've been doing it for two years and I'm excited about that and it's still going strong. And if you've been waiting all this time to see if it would if I would keep at it to check it out. uh, Well, I kept at it. So go check it out. <laughs> RubyTapas.com. We've been doing this show for three and a half years, so I'm still waiting to see if you'll keep at it. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love Ruby Tapas. It's <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, definitely don't miss out. All right. Well, uh, I guess that's a wrap. Thank you all for listening. We'll catch you all next week. A special thanks to HoneyBadger.io for sponsoring Ruby Rogues. They do exception monitoring, uptime, and performance metrics and are an active part of the Ruby community. Where can you learn from designers at Amazon and Quora, developers at SoundCloud and Heroku, and entrepreneurs like Patrick Ambron from Brand Yourself? You can level up your design, dev, and promotion skills at Level Up Con, taking place October 8th and 9th in downtown Saratoga Springs, New York. Only two hours by train from New York City, this is the perfect place to enjoy early fall at Oktoberfest while you mingle with industry pioneers in a resort town in upstate New York. Get your ticket today at levelupcon.com. Space is extremely limited for this premium conference experience, so don't delay. Check out levelupcon.com now. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join the conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues dot com slash parlay.